before uh, this happened, we'll be looking at Josiah, uh, the, the king that uh, began his reign at eight years old. Um, we, we, see that, we know that Saul became king. He was the first king of Israel. He became king in, in the year 1100 B.C., so in a period of uh, 460 years um, after that, we see that Josiah becomes king. So in, in that period of 460 years, we, we've seen a lot of things happen. We see uh, David killing Goliath, then later becoming king of Israel. Um, we see uh, Solomon building the temple in Jerusalem. And we, see, um, we actually see the kingdom of Israel split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of, um, of Judah. And uh, Josiah becomes king of Judah. And uh, um, this is where we pick up in, in uh, chapter 22. Uh, so if we'll stand in uh, reverence to God's word, well, chapter 22, and we'll read the whole chapter. <clears throat> Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jediah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Saphan, the scribe, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work, who are the overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work to repair the damages of the house. To carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accounting made with them of the money delivered into their hand because they deal faithfully. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Saphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Saphan and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and delivered it into the hand of of those who do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. Then Saphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book, and Saphan read it before the king. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam the son of Saphan, Akbor the son of Micaiah, Saphan the scribe, and Isaiah a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because of our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest, Ahekam, Akbor, Saphan, and Isaiah went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikba, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke with her. Then she said to him, Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I, bring, I will bring calamity on this place and it, on its inhabitants, all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender and you humbled before yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me. I have also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I bring on this place. So they brought back the word to the king. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much uh, for your word. As, as it says in Hebrews, 
The, the word of God is living, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. God, may, may we, as we dive into, into this passage, God, may we uh, look to you, look to your word, and may it, may it pierce us today, Eat to the, to the, uh, even to the marrow. God, to the division of the soul. God, may it change us today. God, all of us. God, we thank you so much for this time together. God, bless everybody here. God, thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all may be seated. <clears throat> so we see this chapter gives us the account of, of Josiah, the the, the boy who became king at eight years old. So we can look at uh, chapters 22 and 23 and find three things that can help us today. We see um, the follower, the finding, and the follow-up. So um, let's look at the follower. It's, uh, as we see that Josiah walked and did right what was in the sight of the Lord. Uh, he was one of the few kings that did that. Um, and... Uh, he was the 19th king in Israel. Can anybody name any of the other kings before him? Saul, David. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, uh, Jehoshaphat, Manasseh. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, Josiah was the son of Ammon. Amon was the, the king, uh, a king, and his grandfather uh, Manasseh was king as well, as I just mentioned. Um, Josiah, actually, his name in Hebrew means uh, God has healed. Um, so it kind of plays in the, uh, what we'll be going through here today. So uh, we find in the previous chapter uh, that uh, Manasseh and um, Amon were evil. They didn't walk in the, in the sight of the Lord, and they completely turned Judah away from, from, uh, from God, and they practiced idolatry, witchcraft, and uh, they completely desecrated the temple with um, idol uh, idolatrous um, altars, and they brought in all sorts of things. They dedicated um, horses to the sun god, and they had altars to Baal and Asherah, uh, just to name a few. Um, and so uh, Josiah wasn't taught the ways of, of God because his grandfather and his uh, dad were, were evil. And that's, that's all they did. They didn't, they didn't even think about God from what we can read in the scripture. Uh, but we can see in uh, just a few minutes that that didn't let Josiah stop him. You know, today we always make, make the excuse, well, that's how my family did it. I'm not going to stop. But there's proof right here that just because your, your forefathers did something does not mean that you have to do it, especially in the, in the ways of God. You know, if you feel a, a calling on your life to do something and it, you say, well, that's not how my family did it. I'm not going to do it because my dad didn't do it that way or my dad did it this way. That's not, that, that doesn't work. Um. So, uh, but somehow, Josiah had the word of God instilled in him. And the Bible isn't clear on in, in, uh, where that came from. Could it have been his grandfather, the king, uh, his great-grandfather, uh, Hezekiah, the king? It says that he uh, walked in the ways of the Lord, but not like Josiah. After doing some research, you know, could it have been uh, Jeremiah? Um, we see that um, I'll, if we can look at um, Jeremiah chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. It says, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. So Jeremiah came into the picture when jo uh, Josiah came in. So could it have been that Jeremiah the prophet was um, Josiah's preacher, teacher? We don't know. But somehow the word of God got instilled into, into Josiah, and Josiah sought 
the Lord with all his heart and didn't, did not turn away from that. Um, and whoever it was did an awesome job leading Josiah. As we'll see in just a few minutes, you know, what, what, how God used Josiah. So if, if we're a follower of Christ today, we have a calling on our lives as teachers, parents, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a calling that we must teach. We must make disciples. We must, we must teach our kids. We must teach others the ways of the Lord. What is right, what is wrong. Um, and, uh, how, and parents, we have to teach our kids how to pray, how to read the Bible, how to love others like Christ loves. And, and I, I was heavily convicted when I was studying this because I've not been, I've not been that teacher. You know, I've, not been the, I've not been the leader in my family. Um, and uh, just like Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he grows old, he will not depart from it. If we, if we, train, our, if we train our kids when we are when they are young, we are instilling them, instilling in them a life of spirituality, biblical spirituality. And if we instill that in them and we show them, not just by teaching them, but actually living a, an example, you know, they'll know exactly how to handle situations. And um, like I said, I, I was heavily convicted on this. So, and uh, men... I encourage you, if, if you are a father, I, I know there, we're all fathers in here, I'm sure. Take a step back and ask yourself this question. Am I leading my family the way that they need to go? Am I, am I teaching my kids the ways of the Lord? And not just kids, just, you know, even, even others. You know, we as men can be examples to other men, to other, to other young men. And the same, same with ladies. You know, you're not just called to teach your kids, but to be, be an example to other ladies as well. You know, we have, that is our calling in our, in, on our life. You know, to go, go ye therefore make disciples. And, you know, if, if we're not doing that, what is, our, what is our purpose in being here? And, you know, I've, I've not done it. I've not done it the way I need to. And just, but I, this is so uh, convicting in this area. Um, so we'll see, we see that uh, Josiah was the follower. Now we'll see what the, uh, look at the finding. Uh, as we see in um, chapters, uh, in chapter tw um, 22, verses 3 to 7, we see that Josiah had a main goal of fixing the temple into, into the uh, place that Solomon had it, back to, because um, we see that, um, Manasseh and um, Amon, you know, completely desecrated the temple and turned it over to idol worship. I mean, we see that you know, they brought in all sorts of things, uh, documents, uh, utensils that were just tainted with idolatry. They brought it into the temple, and and you know, they you can't you, they wouldn't they weren't able to use the temple because of all that because it wasn't holy anymore. Um, um, Josiah um, had Hilkiah over um, the money that was brought in uh, from the community to help rebuild the temple. And uh, so uh, while in the temple, Hilkiah actually found the scroll, as we see in verse 8. It says, Then Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Saphon the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Saphon, and he read it. 
So um, eventually the scroll wound up going to Josiah and Saphon the scribe read to Josiah the scroll and Josiah became so distraught and so, so burdened and weary over what was in that book over, because of how Judah had been, how Jerusalem had been in their idolatry. And he became so distraught that he just, he just took his clothes and just ripped them. I, 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 can, I picture like Superman, you know, how he rips his shirt open. I, I, that's, I, that's exactly how I picture him doing it. You know, just taking it and just ripping it and just get being so, so distraught. And that, that was a Jewish tradition. When somebody was in mourning or so distraught, they, they tore their clothes. And we see many examples of this previously in there. Um, and so um, we can look at this over the finding in the temple and... And see, look at ourselves. As Paul, says, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, or do you, know, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who ha you have from God and you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. When we invite Christ in our lives, we become that temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us, much like, he, much like God came and dwelt in the temple in those days, in the Holy of Holies. We are separated, we are consecrated to God, to, to God's work. What things have you placed on top of, on, on top of God's word in your life? What do you have buried? What, what do you have buried on top of God's word? If we, looked, if we dug deep in your life, what would we find? What, what areas of your life would we find other things placed before God? When we, when we find the word, when we dig deep, when we find the word of God, we should be much like Josiah, so distraught over our sin, so burdened that we, we are just honestly a mess coming before God. And, and God will hear that. As it says, you know, if we confess our sins with our mouth, he's, he's faithful and just to forgive. And much like he said that uh, the Lord heard Josiah because he, he tore his clothes and wept. That's where true revival starts. True revival starts in the heart. The heart of, of believers that have gone astray. That have let other things get in the way of you know, what, what God wants them to do. It's time that we as a church in America... You know, get back to that. You know, we see that we see that the U.S. is in a a mess with just so much going on. We have the fight over abortion, uh, over you know homosexuality and everything. If we are if we ourselves as a church turn back to God, He will He will hear us. And he'll heal us. Much like um, Josiah's name. God is healed. <clears throat> we have to be broken. We have to be broken before we can be healed. I was, I was broken two years ago. Two and a half years ago. 23 years I thought I was saved. I, I held positions in church. And I thought, I thought I was doing the right thing. Come to find out, 
I, I was using those positions to justify what I was doing. And I wasn't even in the right. I became so heavily convicted that you know, I, I became saved on a Wednesday night just a couple years ago. And at that, at that point, I was about it. I was just almost as low as I could go, just broken. God picked me up and healed me. And what an amazing thought. <clears throat> so uh, we've seen the follower in Josiah. We've seen the finding of the book of the law. And now we'll see how, how they followed up with that. Um, so after the law had been found, Josiah made it a point to tell, tell Judah about the covenant between God and Israel. Um, he himself called all the leaders in Judah and all the common folk like us to, to the temple. And he actually read the, the law himself. He didn't have anybody else do it. He, he himself read the law to, to everybody. It came from the top down. And um, so right then after, he stood by a pillar. As it says in um, verse 3 of chapter 23, if we'll look at that, uh, it says, Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of his, this covenant that were written in, the, in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. So the king, King Josiah, made a covenant before God and everybody there that the words of this book will be followed. They will not stray away from that. And they will not, nothing will ever change that. And the people looked at him and said, we'll follow you. If we, it's, it's time that our leaders get back to that. It's time that, much like, much like we see uh, a Jonah, as he went into Nineveh, he went to the king, and the king was so distraught that he was mourning. He tore his clothes and put ashes on his head, and the whole nation turned back to God because of the king, the king of Nineveh. If we, if we, if our leaders get back to that, oh, how, how it would change, oh, how it changed our lives today. And right after that, he made a command to Hilkiah the priest and all the other priests. Uh, and he took, on, he took on things full force. He took it head on with no remorse. Um, we'll, we'll look at um, uh, verses uh, 4 through 8 in chapter 23. And the king commanded... Hilkiah, the high priest, the priest of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal and for Asherah and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. Then he removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Judah and in all the places around, all around Judea, uh, Jerusalem. And those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to all the host of heaven. And he brought out the wooden image from the house of the Lord to the brook Kidron outside Jerusalem, burned it at the brook Kidron, and ground it to ashes, and threw its ashes on the graves of the common people. Then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the wooden image. And he brought all the priests from the cities of Ju Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba. Also, he broke down the high places at the gates, which were the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were to the left of the city gate. He took it head on. He didn't wait. He didn't say, oh, well, I'll do it tomorrow. 
You know, he said, we're, we're, we're going to get rid of this today. Anything, anybody, and everything in the temple around the city that dealt with idolatry, he took it and he burned it, destroyed it. Even so much as the priests that were ordained to burn that incense, he destroyed them. Because that's not, that's not right. That wasn't right in his eyes. And it, because he followed God, he knew that that wasn't right. He didn't want any worshiping of idols in Judah. He wanted, he wanted everybody to follow God. And much like the commandment, the, the vow that he made, he said, you know, I as a king and we as a country will not turn to idols. We'll turn to you. Um, there was, um, later in the chapter it says that there was no other king like Josiah. No other king devoted, turned his heart away from, turned his heart to God like Josiah did. None before him and none after him. And that's not saying, it wasn't saying that David wasn't a good king or, or Solomon wasn't a good king. It's just saying that no other king turned Judah away from idolatry like Josiah did. So how should we follow up today? You probably can uh, put the pieces together. Um, when you find the word of God buried in your life, bring it back out and place it on as, as, as top priority. Put God back on the top of your list. Put him ahead of everything, your family, your job, your free time. And get rid of all those idols. Stop making things idols. Complacency, depression, sports, hunting, fishing. It's, it's so easy to make those idols. And anything and everything that takes place before God is an idol. The very first commandment, thou shalt not have any, God, any other gods before me. God is a jealous God. He desires, that, he desires that praise and he desires that worship. And he wants that fellowship with us. And anything that takes that place taints that fellowship. As sin has tainted that fellowship, but through Jesus we have that fellowship now. Through the covenant of the blood that was spilled on that cross. We have that hope. We have that hope of regaining that oneness with, with Christ, with, with God. So we've already kind of gone into you know, how it applies to us today. Um, but let me, ask, let me ask you again. Where is God's word in your heart? Is it buried beneath everything else? You have so much stuff on top of it, you don't even know if it's there. <coughs> or do you have it hidden in your heart that you have that at any, at any given time when you, face a, when you face sorrow, when you face pain, can you bring that back up and, and find peace and find hope in those words that God has spoken? Uh, it says in, in Psalm 119.11, David wrote, Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I may not sin against you. Do we have it hidden in our hearts today? Look deep into your life right now. And ask God to show you if there's any idols. If there's anything that takes place at him. Because he, want, he wants to be priority in your life. He wants to bless you beyond your, your wildest imagination. He wants to give you 
life and life more abundantly. And if we place things on top of him, we're going to be nothing but sorrow. We're going to be walking around like a, looking like a mule looking at a new gate. Just a sour face all the time. I mean, we, we have joy in Christ. You know, why would, be, why would we be looking like that when we have Christ? And we should always be walking around with a smile on our face. Because we have hope. But it, it's just so easy to get drawn into the world today and drawn into that, into that, uh, into the depressions of the world, into the, into the anxieties of the world. And a lot of us put so much time and 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 so much effort into healing that on our own. But we know that you know, cast your cares upon the Lord, cast your anxieties upon the Lord, and He will heal you. So uncover the truth of God's word in your life today, and hide it in your heart that you may not sin against Him, that you can have joy. If we'll bow our heads and close our eyes. <clears throat> uh, we won't have any music.